Hello, and welcome to the Feeling Good Podcast, where you can learn powerful techniques to change the way you feel. I am your host, Dr. Rhonda Borowski, and joining me here in the Murrieta studio is Dr. David Burns. Dr. Burns is a pioneer in the development of cognitive behavioral therapy and the creator of the new Teen Therapy. He is the author of Feeling Good, which has sold over 5 million copies in the United States and has been translated into over 30 languages. His latest book, Feeling Great, contains powerful new techniques that make rapid recovery possible for many people struggling with depression and anxiety. Dr. Burns is currently an emeritus adjunct professor of clinical psychiatry at Stanford University School of Medicine. (laughs) (laughs) Hello, Rhonda. (laughs) Hi, David. (laughs) And welcome, everyone, to episode 268. This is um, a really exciting we're going to do two really exciting episodes. Their personal work with Carly Zankman, who's a beloved member of the Tuesday training group, um, that Jill Lovett, another, you know, the, our beloved teacher of the Tuesday group with David, um, D- Jill and David did the personal work. And um, we've divided it up into two episodes. Um, and first, I want to say to everyone that you may or may not have know, know this, but October was Pregnancy and Infant Loss Awareness Month. And we are dedicating this podcast and next week's podcast to all the mothers and fathers who have lost infants or struggled with pregnancy complications and tragedies, because that is the topic of this week and next week's podcast. I want to just say real quickly an endorsement from Sarah, who's also a member of our Tuesday group. And um, she just called me up and told me that she loved this week's pod, the podcast that came out the week that we're recording this, which was an Ask David podcast number 266. And she said, she, she loves the three of us together. She, you know, Matt's such a great teacher and the three of us, the energy together is really special. And she liked the discussion about emotional eating. She thought it was very um, relevant. Cool. Um, Well, I want to thank you, uh, Carly and Jill for for joining us and and Carly for giving us the chance to do the live work with you. I think the live work is our best teaching uh, for for so many different reasons, but it takes courage to to put your life out there for everyone to see and your vulnerabilities and fears and and deepest feelings. And for that, I have to, 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 to thank you. And, uh, and, and also, uh, I'm reminded that you were pretty anxious at the start, thinking, you know, maybe people are gonna, gonna judge me, and I, I don't know how people are gonna react, and kind of some, some pretty intense performance anxiety, but you brought, brought, you, you gave us a chance to share some of the most intimate and, and painful experiences of your life. And a couple themes that, that come up is that uh, sometimes, you know, our dreams for our life, lives are, are threatened. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and what if my dream w- won't come, come true? And that's uh, that. That's just something that so many people can identify with. And then the second theme is that even when uh, terrible things happen, it's our thoughts more than what's actually happening that that create our feelings. And I know you you've had some pretty shocking experiences, Carly. And even at the time that we were recording this, I, I had my hospitalization for a cardiac event too. And and so we were both kind of partners in crime there, and uh, going going in and out of the hospital, and uh, and and although the events are very real and can be very very negative, it's still our thoughts that create all of our emotions, and that can be potentially liberating because you can sometimes change the way you feel by changing the way you think, mm-hmm. and uh, and then there's one or two incredibly important things that we want to mention before we get started. And, and our beloved uh, <laughs> colleague, Dr. Jill Levitt, will now <laughs> 
put everything into a beautiful perspective and then we'll start part one, which will go over the empathy and the testing part of the session. And then next week we'll have part two, the, the uh, paradoxical agenda setting or assessment of resistance, uh, the methods, <clears throat> the conclusion and, and the final testing. And then we're so glad that we have uh, Carly with us to give us a follow-up on what's happened since that time. But uh, Jill? Yeah, the one thing I would say, so this particular uh, episode is going to be the testing and empathy part. And so there are many, I think, really wonderful and meaningful themes that come up in Carly's work across both sessions. Um, But this first session, I think, is really about a medical trauma that occurred. Um, And David, you probably can relate to that. And I think it underscores the importance of empathy. We took a long time um, with you, Carly, to really listen and have you share from your heart all the details, all the feelings. I kind of have chills remembering it. And I think that that this treatment model that you've developed, David, is so powerful and there's so many amazing methods, but I don't think any of the work would have been possible without us starting kind of slowly and gently um, just really listening and letting Carly tell her story. And I think that's kind of the theme of this first episode. Yeah, if you uh, screw up, as so many of us do on so many occasions, and don't get your A or A plus on empathy, and then you try to move on to powerful techniques, it's not going to click very well for, for the patient because you won't be on the same same wavelength. And that's, I think, why we want to not only measure empathy at the end of the session to see how did we really do? How does how does the patient rate us on trust, on warmth, on kindness, on understanding, you know, how I felt inside, but also during the session asking for a grade, how, how, how are we doing? How am I doing? Is it getting an A, a B, a C, a D? And it's, it's scary to do that. And sometimes I get too scared to do that. But when I when I don't do it, I sometimes get burned because it turns out I was missing a little bit, and and then got out of sync with 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 my patient. So with that, should we dive in? Any other well, starting let, words? Let, let me ask Carly before we dive in. What you know? What led you to want to do this personal work with David and Jill in the first place, and expose your most private, you know, trauma with everyone? I think, um, well, David had sent out an email to the group, just, you know, seeing if the Tuesday group, seeing if anyone would want to do any personal work. And when that email came in, I was suffering pretty badly with um, the depression that I was experiencing. And I just read it a few times and then it's like, okay, I should do this. Um, And having recently just had this medical trauma, the ectopic pregnancy that I had, um, it, it just seemed like a good opportunity to try to work through some of that that I was experiencing. Okay. And um, and I think when you can uh, work with someone's trauma, when the trauma is fresh and raw, it gives you a, a tremendous opportunity. I, I see, and we all see a lot of people who are still working through a trauma from some earlier period in their life, a year earlier, or decade earlier or more but when when the when the trauma is fresh that that's when you can sometimes do some of your most healing and powerful work so let's 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 hear what happens and we'll uh we'll have a more in-depth discussion after uh, the end of next week uh, when we're when we're done we'll see what what's happened in the meantime so thank you, Carly. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Rhonda. Thank you, David. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here it is. G- g- great. And uh, the uh, for for the group, since we're going to be doing some live therapy work tonight, and Jill is going to be my 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 co therapist. We're going to work together with with Carly, who's been having some uh, kind of s- struggles recently. And we'll both be helping resolve those if we can, as well as do some relapse prevention training. And for those of you who are here, th- this is a t- one of our Tuesday groups. We're recording it from the Zoom recording. 
And uh, if you, uh, you know, ask a question or, or whatever, uh, we assume you're giving permission for us to use your likeness and your voice in this podcast. If you don't want your likeness to be seen or your voice to be heard, just turn off your video and and uh, and and your microphone as as well, and then you can kind of kind of listen in. If you do listen in, this is uh, personal work as a part of training as a team. CBT therapist, and it's a an vitally important part of of the training. Uh, we will not enter into a formal therapeutic relationship with Carly if if there's loose ends that Carly that you want to work on or need to work on after tonight's group. Then you can do that with your own therapist outside of the group. Um, one other thing is that although this isn't strictly speaking, real therapy, we do want to treat Carly with the same respect and confidentiality we would anyone we were actually doing actual therapy with. And so that means not discussing any of anything that you hear tonight uh, w- with anyone outside of the group, unless Carly continues to give her consent for us to use it in a podcast, in which case you can talk to anyone about it. And although Carly's already consented to that, we always give uh, whoever's doing the personal work the right to withdraw that permission if in retrospect it it feels too personal or there's some reason not not to use it in a public setting. And with with that in mind, I'll just give a brief summary of what I see, Carly, in your brief mood survey. And then you can kind of tell us what, what what you've been through, we can go over your 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 daily mood log, and then we'll see if if we can can empathize, and uh, get get on on the same page with you, provide support and understanding. Then we'll see if we can develop an agenda for the work we're going to do tonight. See what it is that we can offer, what what it is you'd most want help with, and then uh, once we've mm-hmm. done that and melted away any resistance we'll uh, use some methods to see if we can uh, bring about the changes you're you're hoping to to see uh, and then kate says does david want me to email him um i don't know what that means uh kate uh, but you can email he has he has my daily my daily mood log oh i get it okay thank you yeah so the daily mood log uh, shows a depression score of six out of 20 which is uh only a mild arguably yeah mild depression i i I would say although two, two of them were moderately elevated like the loss of pleasure and satisfaction in life and and uh, lo- loss of uh, uh, motivation to to do things and then uh, the anxiety was eight out of 20 that's that's moderate anxiety and we'll see what mm-hmm. those thoughts were I think you had some anxiety about being doing live work and and the an- anxiety and nervousness were uh, scored a, a lot the happiness is only 10 out of 20 and and that's quite significant that that although you're not you know real severely depressed you're 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 not at all ha- happy mm-hmm. you're not having a lot of joy or fun or you know uh you know f- feelings of happiness and fulfillment in your life and then your relationship satisfaction scale with your husband is 19 out of 30 and that's actually a, a fairly low score. 30 is is the best and zero is the worst. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's only one area that's moderately satisfying to you. That's communication and openness. But all the other areas are only somewhat satisfying or, or, or neutral, like a degree of, of affection and caring and, and uh, feelings of intimacy and closeness are pretty weak and uh, uh, resolving conflicts uh, is a lot of room for improvement and and overall satisfaction in the relationship there's quite a bit of room for improvement as as well so why don't we go back to our, our full view of everyone mm-hmm. and uh, then I might change mine to 
Let's see, side by side speaker. So how would that work? Yeah, so that, that when I put that on, then I see you full screen. And Rhonda, I guess you'll have to set the settings since does everyone see what I see, by the way? I see Carly full screen right now. Does everyone see that or not? Everyone can set their own um, screen. So people don't see what you see. They can set their own screen the way that you set yours, though. Oh, so if Rhonda's recording, maybe she should s set to the same view that we're using. Except I don't think we're planning on doing anything with the yeah, video. Yeah, it doesn't matter because it's just an audio. We're not using the video. Oh, you never know what's going to happen five years from now that they may want okay, this video. So I'll set it to speaker view. Yeah, yeah, that's what I've got. I think that's that's a cool one. Great. Okay, okay so uh, Carly, thank you so much. And can you tell us what's been going on and how you're feeling right now? You might have some more negative thoughts even at the moment in addition to the ones that you gave us here on your on your daily mood log and and we'll listen in and see and see if we can tune in and those of you from a training point of view the idea when whenever you're working with anyone is you want to see if you can get to an a on empathy in a reasonably short period of time including someone you've never worked with before as is the case here here t t tonight and we'll be just doing simple team therapy things you know thought empathy and feeling empathy and i feel statements and trying to understand what you've been going through, Carly, but at the same time to see if we can provide a little bit of, of, of you know, warmth, warmth and support. One thing I noticed in Kaiser is is that they they kind of do medicine like paint by numbers. I never met any doctors. I never mm -hmm. had a history or a physical. It was just they were giving tests and nurses would come by and do things, but no one ever came by to to say hello or here's what's going on with you and the, the, that that personal. Mm -hmm. uh, connection there that I always thought was such an important part of medicine was was almost entirely uh, almost entirely lacking. Uh, but at any rate, we will try not to make that same mistake tonight. So tell us, Carly, mm -hmm. how, how, how you're doing, what you've been going through and so forth. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, David. I think you're you're right. I am feeling quite anxious to be doing this. I've never really done anything quite like this before. So there's a bit of, more than a bit, quite a lot of anxiety to be doing this. Can I um, just uh, stop you already and ask you uh, what, what some of your thoughts are that are making you anxious? It's yeah, like um, I'm not going to describe what I've been experiencing in a way that makes sense or could you could you add that to your daily mood log or to another piece of paper? Yeah, I'm not going to just be able to describe what I've been what I've been going through. Did I get that um, right? Yes, I'm writing it down. Um, and also, of course, just feeling like there's. A lot of people here so there's the potential to be judged by people negatively let's write that down uh there there's there's a potential uh to to be judged by by people and uh those are two two very anxiety provoking thoughts kind of putting you in the spotlight and thinking that uh, you're going to have to perform and have your performance evaluated when those yeah. two thoughts go through your brain how believable are they from zero to 100 i'm not going to be able to describe what i've been going through um maybe like 70 70 and then there's a potential to be judged by people 100 100 okay mm -hmm. Um, so I interrupted you and we'll shut up again. That's okay. Yeah. I think also just noting that when I reached out to you about this, I had told you that my depression had significantly decreased, um, recently. And so I wasn't sure if it was a good time to do this personal work. And you said, oh, it might be a good opportunity to do some preventative work in case it comes back. Um, so that's part of the low depression score, I think, um, 
right now. And I didn't quite get that, that you're concerned that your depression score isn't high enough right now or that it is a little elevated again. <laughs> no, that, um, that it's maybe not high enough right now. Um, but, you know, when we were emailing about it, you had said that that we could do some preventative work in the event that yeah. things don't go so well and, and it resurfaces. Yeah, yeah. Um, so kind of just setting the stage, I guess, for the group around maybe why um, the depression score is is lower. Oh, yeah. Right. Good. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So tell us all about it. Yeah. Um, so in, in like um, November of last year, my husband and I decided to start trying to get pregnant. Um, and I had gone off my birth control in August and in preparation for that, we had, you know, been, been talking about it for a while and decided that we were going to start, start trying, um, giving, you know, my birth control about three months or so to, to get out of my system. Um, and when that, when I, when I went off the pill, um, I noticed pretty quickly that, that my, that my cycles weren't, um, normal, like that they weren't happening on a regular basis. And, you know, my, my OB kept saying, oh, you know, it can take about six months or even up to a year for, for cycles to regulate, um, after you go off the pill. So I didn't think much of it, but I, you know, I'm the type of person that when I want something, like I want it to happen right away. And I think, um, any, a woman that has probably had children might be able to understand that once you decide, like you want it to happen right away. Um, and so I started trying to figure out, you know, how I could make that happen as soon as, as possible. So I realized I wasn't ovulating regularly, so I couldn't track when my fertility windows would be. Um, and so I started using like ovulation predictor kits, um, and I had to use them like every day because I didn't know when my fertility window was. So basically I was checking my, um, my urine every day to, to try to see if I could catch the ovulation window. Um, and that, that worked. Um, for three months, I was able to, to find out when it happened. Um, and I ended up getting pregnant pretty quickly and, and got pregnant in about three cycles. Um, so I had a positive pregnancy test in the end of January and um, was happy and excited and um, at the same time cautious because my, my sister was about to deliver, um, uh, was about to deliver, oh, I'm sorry, my sister just had a baby. And so my nephew was three months old at the time. And, and when she first um when she first got pregnant with her first pregnancy, it was a miscarriage. And so I kind of had that in the back of my mind, like, you know, a lot of women experience miscarriage um, when they're, you know, all the time, but especially a first pregnancy. And so it was cautious, you know, not getting too excited. And so about um, a week later, um, and I'll say about three days later, I got my second COVID vaccine um, and had, you know, all the symptoms and had a fever and all of that and was very nervous about getting my second vaccine and with my doctor and said, you know, is, should I wait um, to get the second dose? And this was in January. So pretty early on, like when only health professionals can, could get vaccinated. Um, and she said, oh, you know, everything's saying that it's safe. So, you know, you should go ahead and get the second dose. And so I did. And then about, um, you know, not at all saying that this is related, but at, at three days later, I, I started bleeding. Um, and so right off the bat, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm having a miscarriage and um, was, was, you know, didn't really feel like a ton of, I felt a normal amount of sadness, I think, but not not feeling like this immense amount of grief or like I had gotten so excited or, or anything like that. Like I felt 
like this happens and I don't get pregnant again just as quickly as I did the first time. And so I went in and um, of course they didn't have it confirmed yet that I had a miscarriage, but went in and it was five, I was five weeks pregnant and she did the, my OB did the ultrasound and um, nothing showed up on, on, on the screen. Um, and so she said, yep, it looks like you've had a miscarriage, but let's just check, you know, your ovaries, make sure it's very rare, but ectopic pregnancies can happen. And that's, you know, when it, it starts to develop in the tube versus the uterus. Um, and she looked, there was nothing in, in, my, in my ovaries or, you know, that she could see. She said, you have no risk factors. So, you know, I'm gonna say that this is a miscarriage. Let's have you go take the, the HCG hormone test and you'll do it two days from now, four to eight hours. Um, and we'll, we'll make sure we'll watch it come down to confirm that you had the miscarriage. So I went and got the HCG test. And then two days later, I went and got it again. And my, my, um, my uh, level did go down. And then um, I just kept bleeding and kept bleeding. Um, and I apologize, this is not for the, the squeamish of those. Um, uh, so I, I, I kept bleeding and so I messaged my doctor and I said, you know, it seems like I've been bleeding for quite a while now and at least, you know, another week had gone by where it was, was bleeding. And she said, okay, let's have you come back in. Um, let's look and so it's, it's possible that maybe I missed something and it just wasn't far enough along and you, you're possibly still pregnant or you're having an, an ectopic pregnancy. Um, and so she, she checks, uh, I'm sorry, it's possible you're still pregnant or the miscarriage hasn't happened yet or you're having an ectopic pregnancy. So I go back and she sees nothing in, in the, the uterus, again, nothing in my ovaries. So she says, you know, ectopic, um, we can rule that out but um, it's likely that the miscarriage just hasn't happened yet. So she goes and has me do the HCG test again. And now my levels have shot up like 10 times. Um, and so she says, you know, it's, it's likely that the miscarriage just hasn't happened yet. I know it's a tough waiting game, but you're just gonna have to keep waiting and eventually you'll pass um, some tissue and you'll have some contractions and then it'll, it'll be, it'll be over with. Um, and so that ends up happening where I pass a, um, some tissue and, and I'm actually like really excited that this is over. I've been dealing with this now for like two weeks of this bleeding and um, I'm happy to see that this happens. And I go back in, she does another ultrasound. I show her the pictures of, of what, what came out of me and she, um, she, says, yep, it, it looks like you had the miscarriage. Um, and she says, let's just have you check the HCG again when you, um, on your way out. And right now it's like a Friday at like five o'clock. So it's the very end of the work day. Um, and I go back and get the HCG again. And now my numbers have increased. So they didn't go down. Um, and so I messaged her on the Kaiser app and I said, is this normal? Like, why would it still be increasing if I had the, the miscarriage? And she says, you know, sometimes it, it, it can take a little bit for the numbers to start to drop. So, um, let, let's just have you go back again in two days. So on Sunday, I'll go to the hospital, get the test again. And, and I'm, I feel pretty certain that it'll come back down. So that's Friday. So that Friday night, I go to um, I go to Shabbat dinner at, at my um, my sister's in law's house, who live right down the street here in Mountain View, and we eat a, a lot of food. And all of a sudden, uh, both my sister and my sister and I start to get like a stomach ache from eating all the food. And I don't think anything of it because she also had a stomach ache from eating. And um, so I, I start to get a lot of this, this pressure in my, in my lower abdomen and, um, and don't think anything of it. Just have, you know, a bad stomach ache. We ate too much. That, that's typical for a, for a Friday night. Um, and 
it, it's not, the next day I wake up and I feel, I feel it's not totally gone, but I feel better. Um, and I end up going on a hike with my friend. And then Saturday night, I go out to dinner pretty late with my, with my husband. Um, and we walk downtown on Castro street and we're eating outside. We eat some sushi and the seven gate comes back on. And this time it's like the most excruciating pain across my lower abdomen. And I'm feeling like this pressure, um, down into like my, into my butt, like there's a, an intense pressure. Um, and we start to walk back home and I like basically curl over on the, on the street. Cause I'm in so much pain. I can barely walk. Um, and we, we got home and I immediately call my sister. Who's a, who's a physician. Um, and she's, you know, been through me with the whole process. And, and she said, you know, um, your doctor said that the, the HCG is, is likely going to come back down. This, this could be those contra contractions that are intensive of, of um, could be the contractions that are finally, like maybe you're finally passing the last bit of the, the miscarriage. She said, but why don't you just call the, the Kaiser hotline and see what they say? So I called the Kaiser hotline and basically you have to tell this entire story to the nurse on the phone. Um, and she says, okay, let's, let's, let me patch in the ER doctor to see what he thinks. So then she has me on hold. And at this point it's like 11 o'clock at night. Um, and so the ER doctor gets on the phone and says, I'm reading through your chart. You know, everything looks like not suspicious of a, of a ectopic pregnancy because they did all these multiple, at this point I had like three, three, um, ultrasounds. Um, but I want you to come in to the ER because if it does happen to be an ectopic pregnancy, you will die if you don't come in. Um, so I, at this point it's like midnight and both me and my husband are like, seriously, we've been in and out of the, the doctor the last three weeks, like really not wanting to go. Um, and so we eventually decide to go and it's like 1 a.m. We get to the, to the ER and which, they, admit, which Kaiser were you at? Um, now I'm at the Kaiser hospital in Santa Clara. On, on uh, Lawrence Expressway? Yeah. That's the one I was in. Okay. The same ER. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and this is right in the middle of, you know, the heat of COVID. So my husband couldn't come in with me. I just had to go in by myself. Um, and so basically they have a, um, they do the HCG test again and they have, a radiologist do a more in-depth ultrasound to look at my ovaries. And like three hours later, the HCG test comes back and it's like skyrocketed. Um, and, and the ultrasound, she sees like a little mark on my left ovary, but she said could not, you know, would not be able to confirm that this is an ectopic pregnancy, but given the level of the HCG hormone, that's what we're going to conclude that it is. So um, now it's like 4 a.m. I'm by myself in the emergency room and all this is happening. The ER doctor is like running in, very frantic, telling me that we need to make a, a, a very quick decision. Um, the OB is going to come down and talk to me, the surgeon, about you know what, what are the options. So she comes out and talks to me and, and says, um, you have two options. Either we can give you this medication, starts with an M, I can't remember what it's called. It's a cancer medication that basically will kill any like living cells other than your own. So it would basically like kill the, the ectopic. Um, and, and this would take about, yes, meth, methotrexate. Yeah. Um, basically would, would, um, it would take about six weeks for this to work. You'd have to come in and have your HCG be, be watched like every other day and, and watch it go down. So it would still be a long process 
um, of dealing with that. Or we can go in with a laparoscopic surgery and um, remove your, um, we, can, we can try to salvage the left tube, but if there is in fact an ectopic, we'll have to remove your, your left fallopian tube. Um, and at this point, I'm like, I can't even think. Like it's 4 a.m., I'm exhausted. Um, so thank goodness I called, I called my sister and she answers the phone because that's just um, who she is. She was up just waiting, waiting to hear anyway. Um, and she gets on the phone with, with the doctor and I was just like, Steph, I, I, can't, I can't even like think, I can't make a decision. I don't know what to do. Um, and she, she basically made the decision for me and, and made the right one because um, my, my tube had began to rupture and I was, the pain was because I was bleeding internally. Um, and if, if I had chosen the medication, I mean, I would have continued to, to bleed internally and probably had sepsis and, and been really, really sick. Um, so they were able to successfully remove the tube and in that process, um, they did tell me like that everything, all of my parts look good. My uterus looked great. My remaining tube looks great. Um, my ovaries look great. So everything in there looks, looks good. Um, so they didn't believe that this would have any type of negative impact on my fertility. Um, so, yeah, so then um, now that that was in March, so this was the first week of March that this surgery happened. So March 7th, um, the surgery was successful. I mean, after that happened, I had to wait like four hours for my COVID test to come back before they would operate on me. I don't know if they made you get a COVID test, David, um, while you were there in the hospital, but. I, th I remember somebody sticking something in my nose. <laughs> there for yeah. Yeah, so all this is happening, and they're, like, getting me ready for surgery, and then they're like, oh, by the way, we need to do a COVID test to ensure that you don't have COVID before we operate on you, so you're going to need to wait, like, another four to five hours for that. To Were you back. in tremendous pain at that point? Um, at that point, I really wasn't in very much pain anymore. Oh. Um, the pain was kind of, like, coming and going, um, so it was kind of odd. I really didn't have any symptoms of of an ectopic pregnancy, like you typically would see, it was just that acute pain from the internal bleeding. Um, so now it's March and you know, I have like a two week recovery period and then I, I really wanted to get pregnant again. Um, and, and my doctor told me there was no reason to not start trying and that this should not have any negative impact on my fertility. Um, and so I start with the, the ovulation predictor kits again. And at this point, um, I start to get kind of like obsessive with it. Like I was checking my, my urine like up to like three or four times a day. Um, and um, I'm trying to wrap my brain around everything that happened. Um, yeah, so about three to four times a day, and I am starting to get really frustrated and, and depressed. Like, it's not, I think, getting, um, I knew that I could get pregnant. I just, again, wanted it to happen when I wanted it to happen. And seeing that I, even after this happened, my ovulation was happening more regularly. So now it was like, maybe every 60 days I was ovulating. Um, and so... I, um, I have like three cycles and I don't get pregnant. And so now I'm starting to think, okay, maybe there's something else that's wrong. Um, and so I decide to. I know, st so, stop just a minute. That was March and you were ovulating every 60 days and you went through three ovulation cycles. That would have been six months. So maybe it was like, so March, so I had, so two of my cycles were like 45 days and then one was 60 days maybe. So okay. it, yeah, so it's about, and, and my most recent one was like very recently. Yeah. Two weeks ago. So 
I, I end up, you know, talking to some people about it, hearing about it and, and I'll, and in the meantime, um, I'm pretty certain that I have, that I have PCOS and in this time, like, and now I know that I do for sure. But at, at this period of time, I'm like pretty certain I did a lot of research and I wasn't getting my, my period regularly. Um, and so, so tell, tell us what that is. Polycystic ovarian syndrome. Yep. Yeah. P-O-S. P-C-O-S. P-C. Oh, yeah. P-C-O-S. Yep. Yeah. Um, and so I um, have a lot of friends that have that and have had similar similar issues. Um, and so I decide, I was like, I'm sick of having to check my, my urine every day. Like, I know that there is ways that you can make ovulation happen. So I, I talk to my doctor at Kaiser and I say, I want to do ovulation induction so I don't have to deal with this anymore of, of kind of obsessively checking um, and kind of have more control around this. And so she says, okay, yeah, we can do that. Let me put in that referral. Oh, you don't have any coverage for fertility. Um, so she, she couldn't even submit a referral for me through Kaiser because I don't, didn't have any coverage. So that's when like the depression really sat in because I was like, oh, now there's, there's really nothing that, that I can do. Um, and, and so I, you know, of course didn't, didn't give up there, but, uh, started this decided that we were going to finally like talk to, I hadn't told anyone about this, by the way, like this whole process, I hadn't told anyone besides my very close family. So decided that we were going to, to tell my, my in-laws and, and kind of ask them for support and help with financially for, for going through this, this process. So I make a appointment with a, one of the best Stanford trained fertility REI doctors in, in the area. Um, and I go in and, um, on the appointment, she, I, she does the, the, the ultrasound and she says, Oh, you, you just ovulated. Um, I can see here that, that you just ovulated. I can see the, the, um, follicle that just collapsed. It looks like you ovulated, um, about a day ago. So you'll either be pregnant in two weeks, or we can start the ovulation induction. And at that point, she also confirms that I have a diagnosis of PCOS with um, I was looking at my ovaries in the, in the ultrasound. Um, and so a week ago, I had a positive pregnancy test. And so that's where I am now. I am five weeks pregnant um, and very high risk. So there's about a 15% chance that all of this could happen again with the ectopic. Um, and so tomorrow I have the ultrasound to see if there's anything in my, in my uterus. Oh boy. Wow. What a <laughs> that's, story. That's, yeah. that's brings us up to today. Um, uh, so you're going to have ultrasound tomorrow mm -hmm. to confirm that it's in the right location. Um, and so are you excited about that or scared about that or? Um, so I'm, I'm feeling pretty optimistic because all of my levels like are normal. So my HCG is in a very normal range where it's last time it was like very high at this point. Um, and my progesterone level is in the normal range, which last time it was very low. So there's like data looks optimistic, but of course, um, my doctor says that anything can can happen at this point. Okay. Well, let me see if if I can summarize this. Or you want to take a crack at it, uh, Jill? You haven't mm -hmm. gotten a word in edgewise here, and I'd I'm love to get to. get you started. Okay, I'm happy to um, get us started. You can interrupt me if you'd like as well. Um, yeah, Carly, thank you so much for sharing your story. And um, I was definitely feeling very sad and you know worried on your behalf as you were sharing all of these details and it sort of occurred to me too even in the way that you were sharing it sounded very much like a traumatic you know experience in the in the sense that these details are all sort of burned into your mind um mm -hmm. 
I don't know if that, that's how you experience it. But that's how that's how it sounded to me. It's sort of you know so many things happened in a short period of time and a lot of twists and turns. But yeah, so um, yeah, I mean, it, it just sounds like you've been through a lot um, in trying to get pregnant and then in you know finding yourself. Uh, pregnant fairly easily but even it sounded like you were describing at the very outset it was very much like a you know intentional once you had your mind on this goal you felt extremely focused and Mm -hmm. motivated and it was very important to get pregnant quickly um and it sounds like I don't know you at all so it sounds like you're you know kind of a researcher and a scientist or a data collector and so kind of at each step of the way you were very much on top of things and trying to like solve each problem um Mm -hmm. but you know it it sounds like you were saying that um let's see uh, uh, once you got pregnant you were saying that you were kind of cautiously optimistic but also having a sister who had had a first miscarriage you were definitely hanging out in the cautious range uh and and at the very beginning as your story starts it's almost like you know oh I might have a miscarriage I'm okay with that like I I get it this is kind of yeah it was very sort of rational but then as things unfolded it was like a mystery right like things would be right you 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 had bleeding and then they checked your hcg um and um like you thought you had a miscarriage but you continued to have bleeding and it sounds like that period of time was really pretty awful and to just be having almost like a pro what felt like a prolonged miscarriage for two weeks or even yeah. more and back and forth to the hospital and tons of tests and ultrasounds sort of all of these things just to ideally just to be done with a miscarriage right probably you're thinking yeah. just be done with this so I can go and try and get pregnant again exactly yeah yeah and then it sounds like you had this um you know after thinking that you were kind of through the worst of it and past it and done with the bleeding you had this just like horrible horrible pain right you I mean you told us you had pain you thought it was just too much good food at Shabbat dinner, right? And then uh, pain after sushi. And then eventually that got to be really like debilitating. And I'm guessing pretty scary at that point too, when you were kind of doubled over in pain and, um, and, you know, could barely walk, right? Yeah, yeah, it was, it was pretty scary. But interestingly, like once we got home, um, and, again, like I'm still thinking it's, this is like a really bad stomach ache. Like I, I, um, I get stomach aches, like not that irregularly. I mean, I never had one that was this painful, but I, you know, didn't think I, again, I, I, in my head, like the doctor had told me that it was that contractions were normal. So I thought that like the pressure that I was having Mm -hmm. were, I mean, I've never experienced contractions. right? Right. So and talking to my sister who just had a baby, she's like, it kind of sounds like a contraction. Um, yeah. So that, that so was you're, where... You're even like relatively calm through all of that, right? Oh, the yeah, yeah. Bleeding, like all of these things. Mm-hmm. But, but again, they told you at the ER, you know, you, you better come in because th- this is when it sounds like it felt a little scary, but you better come in because if it is a topic, we don't think it is, but if it is, you could die, right? And yeah. So that mm-hmm. sounded pretty pretty scary but still it took you a little while till you decided to go to the ER because you had spent so much time in and out of hospitals it was probably the last place that you wanted to be at one mm-hmm. on a Saturday night but um yes and then as you're saying once you got to the hospital and they confirmed that it was an ectopic pregnancy it sounds like at that point you were pretty pretty scared and uh, right like you said just like not even able to think straight and not able to make a decision and here you were alone your husband wasn't with you because of COVID regulations and Thank yeah, you. I did forget I added he was able to come back momentarily and um, they let him through for like 30 minutes or so to l- try to help me make a decision. Yeah. Um, but that, you know, at that point it was. <laughs> but it, it was, sounds like you really yeah. trust your sister and your sister's a doctor. And so you yeah, think she was the one to help you make this choice and. Right. Yeah, I really wasn't like having coherent like thought processes at that point. I was like crying hysterically, right. called her on the phone, could barely really talk, handed the phone to the doctor. She talked to the doctor and then got back on the phone with me and was like, okay, yeah. this is what we're going to do kind it of a just thing. sounds too like such a scary, like as you said, there's these two options, right? And, and one option is, I guess, 
uh, you know, is re- removing your tube, which makes it so that then you only have one tube, right? So that's mm-hmm. like not an easy choice to make. And at the same time, the other option is like taking its own set of chances and also like prolonging this whole process so much longer. Mm-hmm. So it just yeah. Sounds like two unpleasant options to have to choose from in such a stressful situation. But so, you know, you're, you're essentially to get us up to speed, you're saying like, you did go through this, um, made that choice, thank goodness, because it sounds like it was absolutely the right choice. Um, you were starting to have a rupturing, you know, fallopian tube. Um, and then you kind of said, you know, you sort of sped through the recovery. I mean, compared to the rest of the story that, mm-hmm. that you kind of recovered and then in your recovery ended up discovering that you had PCOS, um, which I, I think I understand, but you didn't say much about it. it also, ha- like can get in the way of getting pregnant. And is that right? Is that some one of the Yeah. Um, it's basically like, like it causes like adrenal, I think, I don't know. To be honest, I'm not an expert on it, um, but it, it um, causes like a regular cycle. Some women don't even, you know, menstruate with it. it for some women, they can have like it, it, higher levels of, of male hormones and things right. like that. Yeah. And so again, it's just another piece of information that I gather was like, you know, hard uh, on the road. Um, but you kind of fast forwarding to the last week, you're saying you ended up you know, obsessively checking your, your urine and, and figuring out when you're ovulating or struggling a bit, but nevertheless uh, seeming to get pregnant. And so mm-hmm. guessing is, is what happened that you were feeling pretty down and pessimistic. You, you shared on your daily mood log that you had previously had thoughts like, I'm never going to get pregnant again, or I'm going to have another ectopic pregnancy and then lose my other tube Um, yeah so these thoughts on my daily mood log were probably my were mostly my thoughts like let's say like three weeks ago Mm -hmm. um and so David had asked me to recreate a daily mood log based on what I was feeling like at the let me just quickly quickly go through that uh just uh so clear in everyone's mind what you were thinking and feeling at that time which was really intense and sad that you know all of the depression cluster uh felt all of those words and it was uh, 90 out of 100 and then the the anxiety and and worry and nervousness was 85 the only thing that wasn't elevated was the guilt was only just 15 percent and then the feeling uh, in, in inadequate or in like, let me get my glasses on here i think incompetent and uh inadequate defective. And yeah yeah uh, oh i see it's the one after the word inadequate defective yes uh, 50 percent and then lonely and unloved and alone 90 percent and that kind of hooks in with some things that you've been saying and also the low marital satisfaction on that you took even just just today uh and then discouraged and pessimistic you were feeling 75 and frustrated and stuck 75 and angry and upset 85 and then your thoughts was i i'm never going to get pregnant again that was 80 i'm going to have another ectopic pregnancy and be infertile that was 70 this hope and only happens in one percent of pregnancies but of course it would happen to me and that was a hundred i'm never going to feel fulfilled in life and that's kind of the hopelessness um 75 percent this wouldn't have happened if i didn't date xx i didn't quite grasp that one yeah so um some of these i think will need a little bit of context the first point so the lonely and unloved and alone piece um actually isn't related to my, to my marriage, that, that one more so is, um, I I guess a bit of information that I left out of the background, um, at the time. So in April, we, my, my whole family, including me, my sister, her husband, um, and, and my new nephew flew to, flew to Philadelphia to see our family. They haven't seen, um, they hadn't met our, the nephew yet because of my nephew yet because of COVID. And so it was this big, you know, joyous occasion of everybody meeting him for the first time. And not one person in my family asked me how I was doing. Um, and so that was, 
the the lonely and unloved and alone. Okay. And then who's the nephew? My nephew, his name is Micah. Um, I mean, who whose child is that? Oh, my sister, my sister Stephanie, who is the physician that lives here, oh, and that's I get it. Very, I'm very, very close to her. Yeah. Um, number five, this wouldn't have happened if I didn't date XX. So, um, in graduate school, my I had a serious boyfriend who was a medical student where I went to um to to school, and um he ended up cheating on me in our relationship and gave me chlamydia, and I um didn't know that I had chlamydia because I didn't have any symptoms and I ended up having it for a very long time like upwards of six months or more and I only found out when I went to my my like well women's check and just did a standard STD check um and so that is possibly what you know I might have had the pelvic inflammatory disease which might have ruined my left tube which which could have been the reason why this happened oh I see okay Mm -hmm. And and then I shouldn't have gotten the vaccine when I did, was 50. There's always something wrong with me, 70. We won't be able to afford fertility treatment, 80. And I'll make a political statement that I shouldn't, but I just feel like we need national health insurance in the United States and that this whole private practice yeah. thing competing for health care is just immoral to my way of thinking. I know and I, I, we didn't have to pay much because, you know, we're in Kaiser and I have Medicare, but they charged $45,000 for one hour of that cardiac catheterization. It's, it's ridiculous. Uh, It's horrible. And then, um, yeah, it's, that's why I personally treat everyone for, for free. And I know people have to earn a living, but Mm -hmm. just uh, this, this tension between this exploitative ripoff of people fi- fi- financially. Um, yeah, I think it was the first time in my life. You know, I've always been privileged to have to have health insurance, so it was the yeah. first time in my life that I felt that. And it actually, even though I already have so much empathy for my patients in in the county where I work, but it it the, had me develop even even more empathy for them. Just yeah. imagining what it must be like for them to not you know, um, to be so underserved. When they were wheeling me into the cardiac cath, they said, how are you feeling? I said, I'm feeling really lucky. And they said, why? I said, Mm -hmm. because look at all this that I get that so many people in the world wouldn't wouldn't be able to get this uh, evaluation. Yeah. Yeah. uh, And then I'm, I'm, uh, nobody really cares about what happened to me 70 and I'm all alone in this uh, 90%. So there was a pretty strong emotional component uh, you said the family no one asked how you were doing too in philadelphia yeah i think there was so much excitement about everyone meeting micah and um it was you know this really fun and and joyous trip for everyone um and i didn't really realize how much it was going to hit me during that time but seeing everyone you know freaking out over him um and, and which, which is me, right? Like you, this was at a time where it was after this had all happened to you, but before getting pregnant again. So I'm sure. Yeah. It's like, it seems like two things at once. One, just sort of seeing everyone ooing and eyeing over the baby, which is kind of what you have your eye on for yourself, right? And feel uncertain about. And then on top of that, I guess, just missing out on the like empathy and connection and attention that um, that that you would totally deserve given that you had gone through something so hard yeah I think I, I you know I didn't expect like a lot of attention I just thought you know maybe somebody would say like oh how have you been feeling right. um you know or maybe oh I guess it's it, it might be hard for you to to be here even though you you're you're so excited about Micah too but um there just really wasn't a lot of that. Did you feel hurt and angry? Um, I didn't, I don't think I felt angry, but I think I felt hurt. Understandably, yeah. sure. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you had a lot of anger, but that was more directed toward the universe. I think it was directed towards the universe, the health system, my ex-boyfriend. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, no, 
one like person in particular? Well, I'm so sad that what you've been through, you know, I, I can identify with it a little, little bit myself, having been through some of the same corridors that you mm. were in and, and facing some of the, the, the same uh, kind of shock type, type yeah. of uh, s- situation and feeling like, you, you know, your, your dream is going to be pulled away from you and... Uh, uh, and working so hard to to make that happen, and then probably feeling so sad alone and and not feeling a whole lot of love and warmth and support that that you wanted and 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 needed mm-hmm. uh, and um, I'm just so grateful for you to to share all of this with us and I'm proud of you for facing your fear and taking taking the chance tell me how you're you're feeling right right at this moment now that you've been kind of sharing some of this yeah i'm feeling a lot less anxious my anxiety has gone way down um and you know it it it, i think still feels good i mean um i was able to say everything that i wanted to say and that went okay so i think my anxiety is has gone way down at this point. How are Jill and David doing in terms of understanding how you're th- how you've been thinking and feeling, and providing support? Yeah, I think you guys are doing a a great a really great job. It's it's nice. I I haven't um, had a, a lot of of that, so it's 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 uh, different, and, and it feels good. Yeah, that's great. That, that's really great. Uh, and, uh, you know, we don't always give a lot of, you know, emphasis on empathy and warmth and support. And and for the most part, it's not going to cure many people of much of anything. But, you know, if you don't have it, it's you, you really do. You really do miss it in any human relationship, much less a therapeutic or a medical relationship as as mm-hmm. as well so it's so yeah. important um and i also just wanted to say like really truly how much i admire sort of like how you cope with so many different things you know as you were telling us the story it really did seem like it almost like nothing ruffled your feathers right until you were about to die or you know told yeah. you to die. like you really um you know, not, not that not that it's like important to stay calm or something. If you had been more emotional, that would have been okay with me too, right? But like, I'm mm-hmm. just sort of struck by how much you kind of dealt with all along the way with different twists and turns, and how you kind of continue to roll with things and think, okay, let me research this. Okay, what do we do about this? What's the next step? Like very methodical, and, yeah. and at the same time, like from my perspective, you have every right to feel you know, pretty beside yourself about everything that's happened and, you know, and, and, and sad and, and worried and angry and, and all of those feelings too. And currently, yeah, I think, I, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, you go oh, ahead. I was, I was just um, agreeing with, with you, Jill. I think that was one of the things that <laughs> surprised me the most, to be honest. I was like kind of shocking myself at how calm I was, was staying and um, just kind of, it, it really, I was, I was okay. Like, even when I was bleeding for, for weeks, I was like, all right, like this, this will, this will end. And I was, I was doing okay with it. Um, my doctor even told me, um, that I was the calmest patient she'd ever worked with. And, and I was really shocked by that. Cause I think that I run anxious. So, um, <laughs> that was, that was a, a unique experience for me. And I, yeah. So you did you did good, and you had had to be pretty courageous. I I know what it's like too to go to that emergency room alone. Because when this happened to me, my wife wasn't here; she was out mm-hmm. playing tennis, and I, I didn't know how to get a hold of her. And, uh, and then Alex was saying, "Maybe we should call nine one one." I said, "Oh, that's going to be too expensive. I'll just drive over myself." Mm-hmm. And then uh, and then I think uh, Jeremy, who is working with Alex and me on this app said i'll call an an uber for you so so this uber came by i had to wait at the end of my driveway it was kind of uncomfortable standing there waiting for this uber to appear and then this fellow who couldn't speak english uh drove me over to kaiser 
But when we went into Kaiser, and this was kind of my fault, we took the wrong turn. So we ended up going to the ambulance uh, entrance to the emergency room, which was about a block and a half from the emergency room. And I said, well, go down here, you know. I, and, and he said, I'm not allowed to do that. So I had to get out and walk a block and a half with a heart attack to the emergency oh room. Oh, no. And so it was kind of annoying. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, scary, but, too. But mm -hmm. lucky, lucky that we can get this kind of uh, support. And just again, as you say, it's so sad. So many people in the world, most of the people in the world don't have access to. Yeah. To what they need, but tell mm -hmm. us now what what should we 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 be doing here? Uh, I I could see a lot of directions we could go in, and you maybe have some yourself. But we could do kind of a downward arrow on some of these thoughts, like uh, I'm never going to get pregnant again, and 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 see what that what what's underneath that. What 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 you would be very much afraid of there mm -hmm. uh, we could do kind of uh, relapse prevention training you know with externalization of voices on on these these thoughts uh, there there are several really tremendous things we can be doing including the things you're thinking of and the and the two that jill is about to mention <laughs> <laughs> um no i don't necessarily have one in mind i mean first maybe i i, I guess i would ask you if that would be okay the well Actually, let me go back to the model for one second. We we mm -hmm. empathized with you, and then we asked you how we were doing, and I think you said um, really well. So could I could I be like David and ask you to give us a grade, um, you know, and and let us know are we at an A, a B, a C, or a D, so we can figure out how to proceed? I would definitely say an A. Okay. So given that, um, would it make sense then, do, do you feel ready to kind of shift gears and roll up our sleeves and, and get to work on something? Or do you feel like you need any more time to get more support or more empathy? Um, no, I think I'm, I'm uh, ready to roll up my sleeves. I'm also reading some of the, the chat messages and appreciate all the empathy and support from, from the group. Yeah. Mm, that was so moving. <laughs> I, I know I just love listening to Jill when you give empathy, you know, uh, no matter how often I've heard you, I, I learn something every time. And, you know, your, your, you know, the openness and the warmth of your heart is just so impressive and brings, you know, it's kind of so impressive. I, I mean, I don't have words to say it. Carly. It's mind boggling. It's mind boggling. Yeah. That is humble at yes. the same time yeah. and so warm and caring and mm. set a high bar for, for the rest of us. And you inspire the rest of us. Definitely. Mm. Thank you guys. It's so kind of you to say, and, and truthfully, it was such a pleasure and like a gift to have the opportunity to connect with Carly and to hear her story and to listen and to try to understand. It's uh, especially delightful in this era, historically, when we're getting into so much anger and hostility and beautiful empathy and warmth and compassion is unfortunately becoming rare and, uh, it, it, it is so, so powerful and so important. Well, thank you. And next week, you'll hear the exciting conclusion to the session. This has been another episode of the Feeling Good podcast. For more information, visit Dr. Burns website at feelinggood.com, where you will find the show notes under the podcast page. You will also find archives of previous episodes and many resources for therapists and non-therapists. We welcome your comments and questions. If you want to support the show, please share the podcast with people who might benefit from it. You could also go to iTunes and leave a five-star rating. I am your host, Rhonda Borowski, the director of the Feeling Great Therapy Center. We hope you enjoyed this episode. I invite you to join us next time for another episode of the Feeling Good Podcast.